Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri and head of Prophetic Research Ministry with another Watchman video broadcast. I want to go right to the scriptures today. I want to go to the book of Jude because uh, people send me things every week. They say, Pastor Mike, take a look at this video. Pastor Mike, look at this article here. Pastor Mike, do this. And what's going on in the world is that there are watchers everywhere. There are people who are watching what's going on in the world. They're concerned about things that they see. They're concerned about things that their family members are a part of. And I want us to go to Jude and look at how Jude described, or why he described, we should be concerned. In Jude's letter, he says in, in verse 3, Beloved, when I gave... By the way, the book of Jude only has one chapter. So the verse 3 here. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation. Now, I, I want to stop right here. The common salvation, what that term means is that everybody who is going to be saved is saved all the, the, the same way. In other words, there's not one way for one group over here and another way for another group over here. Not all the, not all the worships and not, not all the uh, religions lead to the same God unless, of course, that God happens to be Lucifer, which, of course, he wouldn't save anybody anyway. He would just condemn them to hell. But there is a common salvation, a salvation. This, the way that I got saved is the way that you got saved, the way somebody over here needs to be saved. There is one way to eternal life, and that is through the cross of Jesus Christ. To write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly, means sincerely, contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The same faith that existed in Jude's day, the same faith that existed in the New Testament times, is the same faith that should exist right now. The same, the same Bible that existed back then is the same Bible that should exist now because he talks about faith and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So the word faith here means that the same Bible that was around in Jude's day is the same one that is around today. It's still the Word of God. It is still inerrant. It is still perfect. It is still the incorruptible seed. We're going to get to that in a little bit. To earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So he said, we need to contend for this. Now I, that word contend, I don't like contentions. I don't like fights between people. It always makes me nervous. Um, I don't like being at odds with somebody and I don't like confronting people. I, that sort of scares me a little. I'm, I have this little weak nature in me. Uh, I'm a little bit of a sissy. But it not... A bad sissy, just a little bit. Um, but I, I don't like contending except for when it comes to the Bible. The faith that was given me. The trust that I have in my God and who Jesus is. Then we should be earnestly contending for that faith. Why? Because number one, if the wrong kind of faith... Let's say, that, let's say the devil has a gospel... A, a sort of like the anti-gospel, which would be the bad news and not the good news. Let's say the, the devil has another gospel, and he does. Should that gospel be allowed to go out into all the world and be preached? Absolutely not. We should stand up against that and say, hey, this stops right here. This false gospel now moves into the churches. You don't believe that? I'm going to read the next verse here in a minute. That false gospel moves into the churches, and pastors start believing it. Pastors who have attended seminary and have attended Bible college, and have listened to the, the scholars and the critics and the Bible doubt casters for four, sometimes six, maybe even eight years, those doctors of divinity who now stand in the pulpits of America and all over the world. And the faith that they grew up on is not the same faith now that they're preaching out of the pulpits. It needs to be contended. It needs to be stood Against, Because he says in verse 4 that it's in the churches. How did it get in there? Certain men crept in unawares. Certain men crept in unawares. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men. Turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Here it is. Certain men come in. Uh, they take the grace of God, the faith, the gospel, the good news. They take the grace of God and they turn it into something that just, I don't know, just doesn't look right. 
It doesn't sound right. If you, if you know the Bible and you believe the Bible and you trust in Jesus, when you see some things going on in the church, you go, that just doesn't look right. I, I can't tell you the number of people that have written, called this ministry, uh, gotten in contact with this somehow, some way, and said, Pastor Mike, we're in a church, got a new pastor, all of a sudden things are changing. We don't know exactly what it is, but it just it doesn't sound right to us. It just doesn't. It just doesn't seem right to us. What they're doing is they're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. We see fornication. We see adultery. We see even sodomy moving into the churches. But that's not near as bad as this idea that's floating in there. You know, all these churches doing all these um, marital sermons, putting big billboards up everywhere, advertising that they're doing these marital seminars and sermons on Sunday morning just to draw a crowd. They're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness and deny, listen to this now, here it is. They are denying the only, the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I'm going to read you a verse in a little bit that Paul talked about, but somebody sent me a video that when I, when I heard what was being said, I went, wow, there's another Jesus right there. When I saw, and you know me, when I saw the symbol in the background, I knew which Jesus it was. It was real simple for me to discern which Jesus this man was referring to. The man in question is a man by the name of Mike Bickle. Mike Bickle is part of the IHOP, International House of Pancakes. No, 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 not the International House of Pancakes. International House of Prayer. I think I would have probably named my church something besides that. Uh, maybe Mac Bethel's or something like that. Uh, but anyway, IHOP, the International House of Prayer. They're related, first cousins, maybe even brothers, to the Kansas City Prophets, um, which is related to um, um, uh, Joel's army. You remember our teaching about Joel's army. Let me, let me just cover this very quickly for you. Let's go to the book of Joel. Because Joel's army, this concept keeps uh, creeping up. Certain men crept in unawares. There's a group of these people, the Kansas City Prophets, the IHOP crowd, and there are others that are linked in with this. Todd Bentley and uh, all of his crowd is linked into this. And God warns, God actually tells and prophesies of an army in the book of Joel. And some of these people, in fact, they're all saying, oh yeah, that's us, we're Joel's army. We're going to be the super Christians. We're going to take over the world for Jesus Christ. We're going to have like super powers and nobody's going to be able to defeat us. And one of these days, a paradigm shift is going to happen. A change is going to take place. God is doing this new thing. Of course, it's not really in the Bible because he gave it to us in, uh, in all these uh, prophets' dreams and visions. That, that's how we know that it's from God. Um, but they talk about a, a new army that's, that's mentioned in the book of Joel. And they say, we're, we're that army. We're going to be the new breed. A new generation of super mighty Christians who have special powers to take over the world. And they compare themselves with this army. The interesting thing, this army in the book of Joel is compared to, uh, uh, to locusts in Joel chapter 1 verse 4. He's compared to uh, um, their, their teeth is like the lion. Uh, they're compared to uh, uh, chariots and the sound of horses and devouring and fire. They're, they're compared to all of that. That's the description of Joel's army given in Joel chapter 1 and 2. But when I look in Revelation chapter 9, actually when I look anywhere else in the scriptures for a description that God's people are going to have the cheek teeth of a lion and that we're going to be compared to locusts, and this, I don't see that anywhere. What I see in Revelation chapter 9 is God's judgment being poured out on the earth. God actually has an army. Did you know that Pharaoh and all of his chariots were actually under the control of God? Go read, go read uh, Exodus chapter 14. You'll see that they were actually under the control of God. Because God stirred up Pharaoh's heart and he took, he took all of his chariots and his horses. Okay, He took all of his chariots and his horses and he went out to get Israel. But actually, God stopped him just before he got there, which meant that Israel was now trapped between Pharaoh and the Red Sea, 
And God led Israel there. So here God led Israel into a trap. And then he brought Pharaoh over here and put him right there. So here is Pharaoh here and here's the Red Sea here. And Israel is going, uh, what do we do now, Moses? And they cried unto the Lord and God saved them. See, God not only was in charge of Pharaoh and his chariots and horses, he was in charge of the Red Sea as well. I, I like God. I like what he's in charge of. Um, the poor Joel's army crowd doesn't think God's in charge of anything right now. They think that they've put us in charge, which is not right. But the Joel's army that's described in the book of Joel, we've covered this several times, is actually described almost exactly the same in Revelation chapter 9. A star falls from heaven... I think I know who that is. And he's been given a key. And he opens the, the portal, the gateway. Okay, um, A new thing is going to take place. He opens the portal. And the Bible describes, oh, look, look there, verse 3, locusts, locusts coming out. Okay, Devils. Devils that look like locusts. And they also look like scorpions. And um, they also uh, have the shape of horses. And uh, they have the sound of chariots. And oh, look here in verse 8. Their, their teeth is like the teeth of lions. That's exactly what Joel described. So the Joel's army crowd, well, maybe they are the army of God, just not the good one. Okay, That army of God, this evil, wicked, from hell army, is designed to chase God's people back to God. When we see things like this going on, it should, not, it should renew our faith and our trust in this book and say, God, I don't want to be a part of that. I want you to make me whole again. I want you to make me right. And so do a little comparing if you want to. But it, here's, here's what really gets me. This is, uh, uh, this is Mike Bickle. This is a form of worship. I'm going to show you a clip of a video. This is a form of worship they call harp and, and bowl worship. Now, I, I, there's something not right about that, and I don't know exactly what it is yet. When I figure it out, I'll let you know. But here's a clip of, uh, of the harp and bowl worship. It, it involves a lot, of, uh, a lot of drums and a lot of guitars, a lot of moaning, uh, a lot of sighing and crying, and it, it involves a lot. But then, but then Mike Bickle, he's going to prophesy now. And I want you to listen. You're going to catch this now. I want you to listen to him. Here's what he's going to say. In fact, I'll, I'll let you listen to it first. Then I'll tell you what he said. Take a listen. Do not be 